Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good Saturday. I pray that you're uh, finding peace and joy and rest in our Father today, especially in these times of unrest. I hope you're uh, finding some quiet time and some time to uh, uh, just be. And hopefully you're not too uh, burdened by this world today or, or burdened by the news. I hope you're finding uh, joy and comfort in the Word and in our Father. Just a couple of things before I start. Um, you know, I don't... Uh, usually, um, I have a pretty good idea of, you know, what I want to discuss as far as um, the word and, and what we're going to, you know, um, go over and, and read. But these last two weeks, I just kind of didn't know. I didn't really have any uh, anything really coming to me as far as what I wanted to do a video about and discuss. So I, uh, I was just resorting to the Torah portions. And... Some of you may or may not be familiar with the Torah portions, but the Torah portions are just, you know, portions broken down so that you're able to read the Torah um, within a year. And when I say Torah, that is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But with the Torah portions that are um, portioned out, there is, um, there's also... A scripture from the prophets and there's also a scripture from the New Testament so these last two weeks I've just kind of resorted to um, seeing what the Torah portions were and uh, last week it had to do with um, the children of Israel the 12 spies going into the land and um, spying out the land and it, it just happened to line up perfectly with the tail end of the video before that having to do with the fallen angels and then this week, once again, I was just kind of like, okay, Lord, you know, um, I'm just going to kind of see what's in the Torah portion. Let's just kind of continue on from there. And this week um, has to do with Korah's rebellion. That's actually the name of the Torah Parsha for this week is Korah. And it was interesting to find out that not many believers have ever even read or been taught um, this scenario and situation regarding Tor Korah's rebellion against Moses. Um, so let's let's. I figured let's just study it and read it and, and see what God says about it. Um, before we do that, I just want to um, let everybody know those of you that asked for um, requested free CDs. I have them. They're getting mailed out um, today. So these are going to be mailed out for you. And anybody else that ever wants some free music, I have an offer that I keep up consistently. So if you ever want some free praise and worship music, uh, I'll be happy, more than happy to mail it to you. You just have to private message me your um, address and which genre you want. We have a couple of genres. Um, I have hip hop, I have reggae, I have contemporary Christian, I have Spanish, and I have Hebrew. So if you're ever interested, just private message me your address and which genre you prefer, and I'll be happy to get that out to you. Just want to keep everybody praising and worshiping. I'm old school, so I, I still have CDs. I make CDs, so, uh, you know, maybe just pop it in your car and you can praise and worship God. It's always good to have some, some new music. Um... So let's go ahead and get into the scriptures um, regarding Korah's rebellion. This is going to be, um, we're going to start in Numbers. And just, just kind of keep in mind God's heart here as far as, you know, keeping order in the, um, in the community, keeping order in um, uh, congregations and groups of people especially when it comes to those that God has, you know, set in place to lead. And, you know, 
God never set someone in place to lead that's perfect. Except Yeshua, he was the only one that's perfect. And, um, but, but all throughout the Bible, you'll see that every leader that God appointed was always flawed because they're men. And men are imperfect. Women are imperfect. And, uh, you know, there comes these times where, um, hello, Ez. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. Um, there comes these times where it seems like this leader that God has put in place isn't doing a good job or, you know, maybe, maybe things aren't getting done the way you want them done. And what happens in Korah's rebellion is Korah and this group of people decide, you know, we're going to sort of step above or into Moses's position to, so hi, hi, Tamara. Thank you for being here, sweetie. Um, to sort, to sort of overthrow his leadership thinking that they could do a better job. So let's go ahead and get into numbers. We're going to go into number 16, verse one. And this whole Parsha 16, chapter 16, 17 and 18 ha all have to do with Korah's rebellion. So let's go ahead and see what this situation is about. Um, so it says in chapter 16, verse 1, Now Korah and the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kat, the son of Levi. So these all were Le um, children of the, of the sons of Levi. Along with Datan and Avrim, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Pelet, descendants of Reuben. So actually you had descendants of Levi and descendants, descendants of Reuben. And remember Moses was also from the tribe of Levi. Took men and rebelled against Moses. Siding with them were 250 men. So he was able to get 250 men of Israel's leaders of the community, key members of the council, men of reputation to rebel against Moses. And um, let's see what happened. They assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much on yourselves. After all, the entire community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why do you lift yourselves up above the Lord's assembly? So, mind you, this is after you know, quite a few years of, probably 40 years of them being in the desert, depending on Moses um, to do what he said God told him to do. And there was times that they were saying, you know, we don't want to speak to God, we want you to speak for us because we can't handle speaking to God ourselves, so you speak to him for us. And then it gets to a point where... Um, they just don't feel like he's doing a good enough job. So Korah gets these 250 men to rebel. When Moses heard this, he fell on his face. So here he is saying, why are you lifting yourself up above God's assembly? And I don't think Moses ever lifted himself up. In fact, if you read um, the whole story of Moses, you'll see that it says that he was the most humble man that ever lived. So he wasn't ever arrogant. Um, he never came off as being better than, he just, he, he didn't even ask for the job. In fact, in the beginning, when God spoke to him through the burning bush, he was like, send somebody else. He didn't even want to go. He didn't even want to go and deliver, be the one that delivered the message of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt to begin with. So Moses wasn't even up for the job. God told him to do it and was there speaking through him during this time. So when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. Then he said to Korah and his whole group, in the morning, the Lord will show you, will show who are his and who is the holy person he will allow to approach him. We'll let God decide. Yes, he will bring whomever he chooses near to himself. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all your group, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. 
The one whom the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. Let God decide. If you have a problem with me, this is what Moses is saying, essentially. You know, if you have a problem here and, and, you, don't, and you don't like me being the leader, uh, let's, let, let God decide. We'll let him re-decide who he prefers to lead this congregation. And um, the one whom the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. It is you, you sons of Levi, who are taking too much on yourselves. This is what Moses is saying to Korah in response. Um, then Moses said to Korah, Listen here, you sons of Levi. Is it for you a mere trifle that God of Israel has separated you from the community of Israel to bring you close to himself? That you can do the work in the tabernacle of the Lord and stand before the community serving them? He has brought you close in all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. Remember, the sons of Levi and the tribe of Levi were set aside to be priests for the Lord. And they were given the duties, the priestly duties, of, you know, everything having to do with the tabernacle. So he says, he has brought you close to close, and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. Now you want the office of Kohen too? That's why you and your group have gathered together against the Lord. After all, what is Aaron that you complain against him? So they're complaining against Moses and they're complaining against Aaron. The sons of Levi were called to be Levites. The sons of Aaron and his descendants were called to be Kohanim. So the Levites had certain duties, but the Kohanim had, you could say, even holier duties than the Levites. But both groups were called to priestly duties. But here Korah and the other Levites are basically envious, you could say, of the Kohanim and Aaron's descendants because of the duties that they were given. He says, after all, what is Aaron that you complain against him? Then Moses sent to summon Datin and Avrim, the sons of Eliav. But they replied, we won't come up. Is it a mere trifle bringing us up from the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert that now you are arrogant? That now that now you arrogate to yourself the role of dictator over us? You haven't at all brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, and you haven't put us in a position possession of fields and vineyards. Do you think you can gouge out these men's eyes and blind them? We won't come up. So Moses is summoning the other group. These are the um, descendants of Reuben. And they're saying, we're not going to go. You know, is it enough that you brought us, bringing us up from a land flowing with... So they're saying that you took us from Egypt, which was a land flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the desert. And now you're dictator over us. This is the way that they're perceiving Moses and Aaron. Now you're a dictator over us. And you haven't even brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Because at this point, they've come to the land. They've spied out the land. And because of the spies, you know, they're all um, disheartened and discouraged because there's giants in the land. And because they haven't gotten there in their time, they're saying, you haven't brought us to a land of milk and honey, and you haven't brought us, put us in possession of fields and vineyards, like you said. Uh, you know, so we're, we're not going to come up and talk to you. Moses was very angry and said to the Lord. So Moses, started, Moses took it to God. He took it to the Lord and he said, Don't accept their grain offering. I haven't taken one donkey from them. I've done nothing wrong to any of them. Moses said to Korah, You and your group be there before the Lord tomorrow. You, they, and Aaron. We're going to settle. We're going to let God settle this. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense in it. Every one of you bring before the Lord his fire pan. 250 fire pans, you two and Aaron. Each one his fire pan. Each man took his fire pan, put fire in it, laid incense on it, 
and stood at the entrance to the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Korah assembled all the group who were against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to the whole assembly. Can you imagine? God bless you, Norma. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having a dispute between people and we're like, okay, we'll let the Lord just settle it. And they go to the tent of meeting with all of these fire, pan, fire pans and the Lord appears to the whole assembly. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from this assembly. I'm going to destroy them right now. They fell on their faces and said, oh God, God of spirits of all humankind, if one person sins, are you going to be angry with the entire assembly? The Lord answered Moses, tell the assembly to move away from the homes of Korah, Datan, and Av Aviram. These are the ones, these are the leaders of the rebellion. Moses got up and went to Datan and Aviram, and the leaders of Israel followed him. There he said to the assembly, leave the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything that belongs to them, or you may be swept away in all their sins. So they moved away from all around the area where Korah, Datan, and Aviram lived. Then Datan and Aviram came out and stood at the entrance to their tents with their wives, sons, and little ones. Moses said, here is how you will know that the Lord sent me to do all these things. And I haven't done them out of my own ambition. You see, Moses, Moses never had his own ambition. He never wanted the job in the first place. And he never boasted about anything that the Lord did through him. He was just he was just merely doing what the Lord um, told him to do and at times he couldn't go further because the congregation was holding him back the congregation lacked faith and that's what kept them for 40 years in the wilderness it wasn't Moses but you know what sometimes we don't want to take responsibility for our own actions we don't want to take responsibility for our own ineptness or our own inabilities so we want to put blame on leaders we want to put the blame on those who are in leadership because we don't want to take responsibility so here they are blaming Moses for not getting into the land and and basically um, you know stirring up strife so let's see what happens Moses said, here is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things. And I haven't done them out of my own ambition. If these men die a natural death, like other people, only sharing the fate common to all humanity, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord does something new, if the ground opens up and swallows them with everything they own, and they go down alive to the grave, then you will understand that these men have had contempt for the Lord. The moment he finished speaking these words, the moment Moses stopped talking, the ground under them split apart, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, all the people who had sided with Korah and everything they owned. So they and everything they owned went down alive to the grave. The earth closed over them now that's kind of strange. The earth opens up and then it closes back. I mean, I can I can see the the earth opening up, but the fact that it closed back is kind of scary. Um So they and everything they owned alive to the grave and the earth closed over them and their existence into the community ceased. All Israel around them fled to their sh fled at their shrieks shouting the earth might swallow us too. Then fire came out from the Lord and destroyed the 250 men who had offered incense. So all those 250 men that were following Korah in their rebellion were consumed by a fire by the Lord. So chapter 17, the Lord said to Moses, tell El Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, to remove the fire pans from the fire and scatter the smoldering coals at a distance because they have become holy, because God's presence had come down and consumed them. 
Also the fire pans of these men whose sin cost them their lives have become holy because they were offered before the Lord. Therefore, have them hammered into plates to cover the altar. This will be a sign for the people of Israel to remember forever. Because it is quoted in the, De in the New Testament to remember the rebellion of Korah. It's, it's, it's kind of like the spirit of Cain who was so jealous of his brother Abel um, that God, you know, had accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. And there's a reason for that. But because God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's, Cain allowed his, his envy and jealousy and anger to, um, to kill his brother. So let's go on. Um, Eliezer the Cohen took the brass fire pans, which the men who had been burned to death had offered, and they hammered them into a covering for the altar to remind the people of Israel that an ordinary person not descended from Aaron is not to approach and burn incense before the Lord. If he wants to avoid the fate of Korah and his group, as the Lord had said to him through Moses. But the very next day, the whole community of the people of Israel complained against Moses. So all of this happens. The ground opens up, swallows up Korah and these three guys. All 250 men are burned up. And the very next day, the whole community of Israel is complaining against Moses and Aaron. And said, you have killed the Lord's people. God creates this miracle, destroys these people, and again, they're blaming Moses and Aaron for them being killed. I mean, you can't, you can't, how can you blame Moses and Aaron for the ground opening up and closing up and the fire of the Lord coming down and consuming these people? However, as the community was assembling again, Moses and Aaron, assembling against Moses and Aaron, they looked in the direction of the tent of meeting and saw the cloud cover it and the glory of the Lord appear. Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. The Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly and I will destroy them at once. But they fell on their faces. Moses said to Aaron, take your fire pan, put fire from the altar in it, lay incense on it and hurry with it to, assemb to the assembly to make atonement for them. So look at the hearts of Moses and Aaron here. God is about to destroy the rest of the assembly. He's like, I've had it, you know, you know, that happened. That also happened at um, the instant with the, the golden calf where God was like, I'm going to wipe them all out and start over. And Moses pleaded on their behalf and said, don't do it. Your, reput your reputa reputation is at hand, is at stake here. So don't destroy the people. Moses could have easily said, okay, go ahead. You know, I'm tired of them too. But he didn't. Him and Aaron fall on their faces and offer sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of the rest of the assembly. Hurry up and assemble and make atonement for them because anger has gone out from the Lord and the plague has already begun. Aaron took it, as Moses had said, and ran into the middle of the assembly. There the plague had already begun among the people. But he added the incense incense and made atonement for the people he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped those dying from the plague numbered wow those dying from the plague numbered 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident so 14,700 other people died in the plague because they started complaining against Moses and Aaron the, the, the fire of the Lord broke out, and if it wasn't for Moses and Aaron standing in the gap for them, who knows how many would have perished. Besides those who died in the court. Okay, so Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the plague was stopped. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and take from them staves, one for each ancestral tribe from each leader of a tribe. Twelve staffs, because there was twelve tribes. Write each man's name on his staff and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi for each tribe's leader, 
leader is to have one staff. Um, hold on one second here. Yeah. <laughs> Norma's like, obedience to the Lord. Amen. So, um, so they're making stabs for each tribe, each tribe leader. Put them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. The staff of the man I am going to choose will sprout buds. In this way, I will pull a, put a stop to the complaints the people of Israel keep making against you. So the Lord is trying to create all these miracles and these situations to show the people of Israel that you shouldn't be complaining against him. This is who I've put in place as leader. Moses spoke to the people of Israel and all their leaders gave him staffs, one for each leader, according to their ancestral tribes, 12 staffs. Aaron's staff was among their staffs. Moses put the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. The next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony and there he saw Aaron's staff for the house of Levi had budded. So all of the tribes created cut their own staffs and it was only Aaron's staff for the tribe of Levi that budded. Only God can make that happen. It had sprouted not only buds, but flowers and ripe almonds as well. Moses brought out all the staffs before the Lord to all the people of Israel and they looked and each man took back his staff. The Lord said to Moses, return Aaron's staff to its place in front of the testimony. It is to be kept there as a sign to the rebels so that they will stop grumbling against me and thus not die. Moses did this. He did as the Lord had ordered him. But the people of Israel said to Moses, oh no, we are dead men lost. We are all lost. Whoever, whenever anyone approaches the tabernacle, tabernacle of the Lord he dies will we all perish so now they're all afraid that they're going to die um, so now we're in chapter 18 the Lord said to Aaron you and your sons and your father's family line will be responsible for anything that goes wrong in the sanctuary because they were called God called them to have those duties in the tabernacle in the sanctuary you and your sons with you will be responsible for anything wrong in your service as Kohanim. But you are to bring your kinsmen, the tribe of Levi, among with yourselves, to work together with you and help you, you and your sons with you, when you are there before the tent of meeting. There are to be at your disposal and they are to be at your disposal and perform all kinds of tasks related to the tent. And later on it had to do with the temple only they are not to come near the holy furnishings or the altar so they ne so neither they nor you will die they will work together with you in your duties related to the tent of meeting whatever the service in the tent may be but an unauthorized person is not to come near you you will take charge of all the holy things and the altar so that there will no longer be anger against the people of Israel. I myself have taken your kinsmen, the, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They have been given a gift as a gift to the Lord for you, so that you can perform the services in the tent of meeting. You and your sons will exercise your prerogatives and duties as Kohanim in, in regard to everything having to do with the altar within the curtain. I entrust the service required of Kohanim to you. The unauthorized person who tries to perform it is put to death. God had certain people doing certain things. And no unauthorized person was supposed to do any of the holy duties. The things that have to do with the Lord are very holy and God takes them very seriously. The Lord said to Aaron, I myself have put you in charge of the contributions given to me. Everything consecrated by the people of Israel I have given and set aside for you and your sons. This is a perpetual law. Here is what is to be yours of the especially holy things taken from the fire. 
Every offering they make, that is every grain offering, sin offering, and guilt offering of theirs that they turn over to me will be especially holy for you and your sons. You are to eat it in an especially holy place. Every male may eat it. It will be set apart for you. And, and remember here that all later on you'll see um, in the Torah, when the children of Israel go into the land, God gives land to each tribe. But the Levites were not ever given any land. They were given a small community within each tribe so that each community, each tribe <clears throat> and their land had their own Levites, so their own priests. But the priests weren't ever given their own land. You never saw the land of Levites. There was the, you know, there was the land for the tri for every tribe except for the Levites. The Levites portion was God and his holy presence and his the holy duties that came along with that. Also yours is the contribution the people of Israel give in the form of wave offerings. I have given this, those to you, your your sons, your daughters with you. This is a perpetual law. Everyone in your family who is clean may eat it. All the best of the olive oil, wine, and grain, the first portion of what they give to the Lord, I have given to you. The first produce, in turn, ripe of all that is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, is to be yours. Every clean person in your family may eat it. Everything in Israel which has been consecrated unconditionally is to be yours. Their duties were priestly duties and everything that came along with that was their portion they didn't have the land they weren't given a portion in the land but they were given the holy things of the Lord <clears throat> everything that comes first out of the womb all of the living things which they offer to the Lord whether human or animal will be yours however the firstborn of a human being you must redeem and the firstborn of an unclean beast you are to redeem the sum to be paid for redeeming anyone a month old or over is five shekels he goes on um, to show that all, basically all the offerings that had to do uh, <clears throat> with Israel were given to the priests. All the contributions of holy things which the people of Israel offered to the Lord, I have given to you, your sons, your daughters with you. This is a perpetual law, an eternal covenant of salt before the Lord for you and your descendants with you. The Lord said to Aaron, you are not to have any inheritance. See, this is what I was explaining. You are not to have any inheritance or portion in their land. I am your portion and inheritance among the people of Israel. So that's what I was saying. The Levites were never given an inheritance or a portion in the land. The Lord was their portion. He says, for the, for the Lord, for you and your descendants, you are not to have any inheritance. I am your portion and inheritance among the people of Israel. To the descendants of Levi, I have given them the entire tenth of the produce collected in Israel. It is their inheritance. So you see, the tithe was for the priests. That's why the tithe was given, because they didn't have an inheritance. So that's that's how they ate, that's how they sus were sustained, was by the tithes. The tithes and offerings were for the priests. Because <clears throat> their services were to be close they had to be closer to God their services to God and their services to Israel to, to the to the people of Israel um, it is their inheritance in payment for the service they render in the tent of meeting from now on the people of Israel are not to approach the tent of meeting so that they will not bear the consequences of their sin and die only the Levites are to perform the service in the tent of meeting and they will be responsible for whatever they do wrong this is to be a permanent regulation through all your generations. They are to have no inheritance among the people of Israel because I have given the Levites as their inheritance the tenths of the produce which the people of Israel set aside as a gift for the Lord. That is why I have said to them that they are to have no inheritance among the people of Israel. So we're almost through with, uh, with numbers here. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Levites, when you take from the people of Israel the tenth of the produce which I have given you from them as the inheritance you are to set it aside as a gift for the lord one tenth of the tenth the gift you set aside will be accounted to you as if it were grain from the threshing floor and grape juice from the wine vat um 
You're to give it to Aaron the Kohen as a gift for the Lord. <clears throat> From everything given to you, you are set it aside. All that is due to the Lord, the best part of it, its holy portion. Therefore, you are to tell them, when you set aside from it, from its best part, it will be accounted to the Levites as if it were grain from the threshing floor and grape juice from the wine vat. You may eat it anywhere you and your households because it is your payment in return for your service in the tent of meeting. So basically the tithe and the offerings and the portion that was given to the priests and Levites had to do with the fact that this is how they were sustained and this was their portion in return for their priestly services um, that, that they were doing in the tent and then later on in the temple. Moreover, because you have set aside from it its best parts, you will not be committing any sin because of it. You are not to profane the holy things of the people of Israel or you will die. So, we can, we can learn from this that, you know, if, if God appoints someone... Is it, is it right to try and overthrow them? Is it right to try to overthrow leadership that God has put in place? And here, here's an even more, here's an even more, um, here's an even deeper question. Is it only holy people that God puts into place? Is it only people of God that God appoints and puts into power? No. And how do we know that? Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar was put into place by God? Did you know that Pharaoh was put into place by God? And how do we know that? Well, let's turn to Jeremiah 27.6 really quick. Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah, chapter 27, verse 6. Does anybody come into power by their own accord, or does God allow them to be in that power, even if they're evil? Norma says yes. She gets it. Hallelujah. Tamara gets it. She, hallelujah. She understands. No, God allows all things. Jeremiah chapter 27 verse 6 says, For now I have given over all these lands to my servant Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. Of Babel. I have also given him the wild animals to serve him. All the nations will serve him, his son and his grandson, until his own country gets its turn. At which time many nations and great kings will make him their slave. There's a time and a place for every, there's a time and a season for every leader. Um, the nation and kingdom that refuses to serve this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, that will not put their necks under the yoke of the king of Babel, I will punish. Let's just park there for a moment. Okay. So you have the king of Babylon, who was a known, you know, ended up losing his mind and was an evil, evil leader. But you have the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, being put into place by God, okay? And God says this, the nation and kingdom that refuses to serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that will not put their necks under the yoke of the king of Babel, who I put into place, I will punish. So God is saying, even this evil ruler who I have put into place, if those who do not serve him, I will punish. So my question is, are we called as believers or even non-believers, because God is speaking to anybody, any, any of the surrounding countries that did not come under Nebuchadnezzar's rule were 
were said he said he was going to punish. So are we as believers to rebel against leadership in our own countries? Now, that's different from coming against maybe um, laws that are being passed or having our own um, right to vote against certain um, laws that are being passed. But what does God say about the actual leader itself? I will punish with sword, famine, and plague until I have put an end to them through him. So you're telling me that God doesn't call us to come against even evil leaders? Why is that? Are you saying that God has an agenda and a purpose for whoever God puts into place, even if they're evil? Even if they're not God-fearing? I, I, I would submit to you that that's what, that's what the Bible is saying. But let, let's see what he said about Pharaoh. Uh, Roman, let's go to Exodus. First we'll go to Exodus because they're, they're both the same uh, scripture, just repeated twice. Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. We're talking about Pharaoh here. It says, but it is for this very reason that I have kept you alive. And he's speaking about Pharaoh. To show you my power so that my name may resound through the whole earth. He says, um, hold on, let's, um, let's read Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17, I think, is basically quoting what I just read. Um, <clears throat> for the Tanakh says to Pharaoh, it is for this reason that I have raised you up, so that in connection with you, I might demonstrate my power so that my name might be known throughout the world. So then, he has mercy on whom he wants, and he hardened whom he wants. So, does God put into place of power and leadership whomever he wants? Does God put into power and place and leaders of nations whom he wants? Norma says yes. Hallelujah, she gets it. So is it right and just for us to rebel against leadership? Well, I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Let's see here. So the next... Uh, Okay, let's see here. 1 Samuel 11, 14. 1 Samuel 11, 14. 1 Samuel 11, 14. Are you saying, yes, yes, you should rebel against leadership? Norma and Tamara? Yes, yes. Are you saying, yes, we should rebel against leadership? Is that what you're saying? Let's read 1 Samuel 11:14. Then Samuel said to the people, "Come, let's go to Gilgal and inaugurate the kingship there." So all the people went to Gilgal, and there in Gilgal before the Lord, they made Shaul, which was Saul, king. 
They presented sacrifices as peace offerings before the Lord there, and there Saul and all the people of Israel celebrated with great joy. Samuel said to all of Israel, Here, I have done everything you asked me to do. I have made a king over you. There is the king walking ahead of you, but I am old and gray-headed. There are my sons with you, and I have walked at your head from when I was a boy until now. So here I am. Now is the time to witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed king. Does any of you think I have taken your ox or donkey, defrauded or oppressed you, or accepted a bribe to deprive you of justice? Tell me, and I will restore it to you. And they answered, You haven't defrauded or oppressed us. And you have accepted nothing from anyone. He said, The Lord is a witness against you, and his anointed king is a witness against you today, that you have found nothing in my hands. He is a witness. Uh, we have to remember that God has the power to know age beginning from the end, so yes, he does. No, we should not. Okay, I, I, I see what you're saying now. No, we should not. Um... Okay, Norma, I see what you're saying now. Um, so, so here we are in the book of Samuel. This is when they, the people begged for a king. God was supposed to be the king of Israel. They weren't supposed to have a physical king, but the people of Israel begged for a physical king. So God said, okay, I'll give you Saul. Samuel said to the people, It was the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your ancestors from the land of Egypt. Now hold still, because I am going to enter judgment with you before the Lord regarding all the righteous acts of the Lord that he did for you and your ancestors. After Jacob had entered Egypt, your ancestors cried to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and had them live here in this place. But they forgot the Lord your God. So he handed them over to Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and to the Philistines, and to the king of Moab, and they fought against them. But they cried to the Lord and said, We sinned by abandoning the Lord and serving the Baal, Baalim and the Asherah, basically foreign gods. Tamara says, No, that God picks whom he wants and where he wants them, even if they are not fully believers, and God is always in control. Amen. Yeah. God, God chooses whom he wants, when he wants, and he'll do what he wants with whomever he wants. That's true. I would even venture to say, as evil as Adolf Hitler was, God allowed him to come to power. And as evil and diabolical as the Holocaust was, if that never happened, uh, it was almost like a catalyst because the children of Israel, the Jews of that time, they weren't they weren't going back into the land there wasn't um any law that was allowing them to go back into israel but because of the holocaust as debaucherous as it was laws were passed that they were able to go back into the land you know god has his own reasoning and his own ways for putting people into places of power and places of leadership and you know we can't complain to those leaders when we should be taking it up with God if God I can't remember who quoted it but they said we deserve the leaders that we get the leaders that we have put over us are the leaders that we deserve if we have unrighteous and unholy leaders over us it's because we have become unrighteous and unholy ourselves to deserve such a unrighteous and unholy leader. God does everything for a reason. He's trying to get our attention. But instead of looking at our, our, our spiritual state, instead of looking at our country's spiritual state, we want to point the finger at the leader. Instead of looking at ourselves as a nation and saying, we have become like the world. We have become unholy. We have gotten away from God. And this is why he's allowing these people to come into power. 
But instead of doing that, we decide to just point the finger and blame and complain and moan. It, it, it's, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's being done today was done during these times. These people were moaning and complaining and saying, you're not, you know, you haven't done what you promised and said you were going to do. You know, Moses and Aaron are just a bunch of politicians, empty promises. Instead of looking at themselves... When the children of Israel were worshiping false gods and the children of Israel were lacking faith. But they want to blame the leaders. So this is the same thing that Samuel is saying. And he's actually bringing up the situation with Moses and Aaron to make a point. Um, he said, after Jacob had um, entered I Egypt, your ancestors cried to the Lord, you know, he sent Moses and Aaron there to deliver you. But they forgot God, and they started worshiping false gods. This is exactly what's happening in our countries today. We get away from God, start worshiping false gods, but then we blame the leadership that's over us. When ultimately, God is arranging situations because of our actions. We forget to go to the one that has the power to change things. Bingo. Norma, you just hit the nail on the head. If we're not happy with, with, with who's leading our country, we need to look in the mirror. We need The only ones who can change what our future and our present is going to be is us, not the leader. That leader is not going to do anything except God's will. Whether you like it or not, whatever that leader is doing is God's will, but God's will is in response to our spiritual state. So, you know, you know, God's been taken out of schools, God's been taken out of the workplace, God's been taken out of all these institutions. What do we expect to happen? There is nothing different happening then from now. Yep, that's right. Nothing new under the sun. So here's Samuel saying, but you went off and worshipped other gods, but now if you rescue us from the power of our enemies, we will serve you. So the Lord said, uh, hold on, let me see here. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the people of Ammon, was attacking you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us. Remember, the people of Israel demanded a physical king. Prior to King Saul, King Saul was the very first king of Israel. Prior to that, you had the priests and the priestly system, the prophets, and you had the Lord ruling and reigning. He was the king. And the Lord, your God, was your king. See, I just said it. So you said, no, we want a king to rule over us. When the Lord, your God, was your king. Now here's the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has put a king over you. If you will fear the Lord, serve him. Obey what he says and not rebel against the Lord's orders. If you and the king ruling you remain followers of the Lord your God, then things will go well for you. But if you refuse to obey what the Lord says and rebel against the Lord's orders, then the Lord will oppress both you and your leaders. So it says it right here. It, everything in the Bible is so black and white. If you obey God, you will prosper. Things will go well for you. If you don't obey God and you get away from God's commandments, he will put people over you to oppress you. Yes, Norma said, be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. You ask for it. Then you start complaining about it, and now you want to blame the people that put him there when you asked them to put him there. God help us. You know, I feel so sorry for God. I would never, ever, ever, ever want to be God. He has, he has to deal with so much. He gets blamed when things are going wrong, and then when things are going right, man takes the credit. I feel so sorry for God. I, I would never want to be in his position. Never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever. Never would I want to be God. He has to deal with so much. I mean, 
people are begging for a king, they get the king, then they're unhappy with what's happening, the people go off and worship foreign gods, and then they're complaining to the leadership that they begged for. I mean, it's just, this is this, this is the madness of what is happening today in the world. This is the madness of what is happening today in the world. You want to blame leadership for what's happening, but what's happening is a result of your actions and the result of us, us collectively getting away from God. We're missing the big picture. We're missing the forest from the trees because we're so caught up in the minutia. All right, so let's uh, let's see what is uh, in the New Testament here, the Newer Testament. It's actually called the Brit Hadashah, which is the New Covenant. I like to call it the New Covenant. Um, when you call it Old Testament and New Testament, it makes the old sound old and dusty. Um, I like to call it the New Covenant, and I like to call it the, uh, you know, the Tanakh. Or the Older Testament. So, for this Torah Portia, the, the scripture that's given is John 19, 1. Uh, John 19, 1. <clears throat> There's always a, a Newer Testament Brit Hadashah reading with every uh, Torah Portia. John 19, chapter 19, verse 1. Chapter 19, verse 1. I haven't read it yet, so let's read it together. I don't even know what it, what it's, what it says. John 19, 1 through 17. So Pilate took Yeshua and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted thorn branches into a crown and placed it on his head. They put a purple robe on him. And when, I know where this is going. God is so good. I know where this is going. So they put a crown on his head. They put a purple robe on Yeshua. Went up to him over and over. Hail the king of the Jews and hit him in the face. So they, they were basically mocking him. Pilate went outside once more and said to the crowd, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to get you to understand that I find no case with him. He hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't committed any crimes. Pilate said to them, Look at this man. When the head Kohanim... And the temple guards saw him. They shouted, put him to death on a stake. Put him to death on a stake. Pilate said to them, you take him out yourselves and put him to death on the stake. Because I don't find any case against him. The Judeans answered him, we have a law according to that law. We have a law and according to that law, he ought to be put to death because he made himself out to be the son of God. On hearing this, Pilate became even more frightened. <clears throat> so this is Pilate's solution. I'll solve this problem. He went back into the headquarters and asked Yeshua, Where are you from? But Yeshua didn't answer. So Pilate said to him, You refuse to speak to me? Don't you understand that it is in my power either to set you free or to have you executed on a stake? Yeshua answered, you would have no power over me if it hadn't been given to you from above. That was a very powerful statement from Yeshua. Basically, the Romans are in power right now over the Jews because God has put them in power over the Jews. <clears throat> this is why the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. On hearing this, Pilate tried to find a way to set him free. He's trying to set Yeshua free. But the Judeans shouted, If you set this man free, it means you are not a friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king is opposing the emperor. When Pilate heard what they were saying, he brought Yeshua outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the pavement. It was about noon on preparation day for the Passover. And he said to the Judeans, here is your king. They shouted, take him away, take him away, put him to death on a stake. Pilate said, you want me to execute your king on a stake? The head Kohanim answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Yeshua over to them and had him put him to death on a stake. <clears throat> okay. 
So they took charge of Yeshua, carrying the stake himself. He went out. So basically, what happened here was, they, 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 this is when, this is when they had chose to have Yeshua executed on a stake instead of a criminal. So you want this innocent person who says he's the son of God to be executed on a stake and we want to release Barnabas who was a known killer and was imprisoned for murder to be released instead. You see how the masses can be absolutely um, nonsensical? How sometimes the masses just don't make any sense? Any, any good sense? How does it make sense to bring out a criminal, release a, a criminal from prison, and have this innocent man executed on a stake? It just doesn't make any sense. But sometimes the crowd is so caught up in emotion that they're not thinking. Sometimes we can be so caught up in, in emotion that we're not thinking logically about the situations of what's going on in society. It, it, it just, it's not logical. And you know, we're seeing a lot of this right now. People aren't thinking critically. People aren't thinking with the word. They certainly aren't thinking with the word. But they're just not, they're not even thinking with reason anymore. Reason has gone out the window. And now we are <clears throat> seeing the results of that. And I tell you, this, 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 in my opinion, this couldn't have come at a better time. You see, and I used to, I always used to, I'll just to tell you something personal. I used to always, I, every single week I read the Torah portion. And I do want to encourage you to read the Torah. And when I say the Torah portions, if you, um, I have, my, my Bible is the complete Jewish Bible. This has the Torah portions broken up. And you'll see, um, it'll say, it'll have the Torah portion, and it'll have the name of the Torah portion. Regular Bibles don't, don't have it broken up that way. I also have a, a Hebrew calendar that has the Torah portion for that week. And then you read the Torah portion for that week. And I will submit to you that God spoke to me perfectly nearly every week. And that Torah portion lined up perfectly. But it was always different because every year there's something different going on in your life. You're always going to a new level. But I'm telling you, um, it, it is the first five books. You'll go through Genesis, Ex uh, Genesis Exodus, Num Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And there will be a there will be a uh, a prophet reading, and there will be a newer testament reading as well. And I'm telling you, when I I used, to, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing it, which I I want to get back in the habit of doing it. Um, but I was doing it for so long, I I kind of started doing other things. But God always lines His word up perfectly. For some reason, it was always lining up perfectly, and I just feel like. This Torah portion this week perfectly displayed and shows how God puts people in place of power for a reason, in the place of leadership for a reason. And the only one that you need to complain to about, you need to take it up with God. If you don't like who is leading your congregation, if you don't like who's leading your country, you need to take it up with God. 
You need to take it up with your maker because he's the one that put them there. He is the one who put them in place of power. If you got a problem with it, take it to the source. And one person by ourselves, we cannot do it, but we suffer as a, as a collectively as a body. We suffer collectively as a country because even though God does keep a remnant of people that are, are still close to him, collectively, if we are, you know, allowing laws to be passed that are completely destroying um, morals and God's commandments, then we are collectively going to suffer. And God is going to put people in power who will either do us good or, 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 or even the Bible says, who will oppress you. So, I hope that I hope that some of you will listen to this and 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 take it, uh, Norma and Tamara. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, sisters. But I hope that some of you will watch this and take it into consideration and say. Although I, I, I'm sure most of you are are already on the same page, but I, I do think that I, I hope you'll share this, share this video with some people. That you know that are getting wrapped up in the emotion of, 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 of just, you know, complaining to leadership and complaining about people in power emotionally because they're looking at it on this level and they're getting caught up in the minutia that they're not seeing it from God's perspective. They're not seeing it from the big, the big picture. They're missing the forest from the trees. Share this video with them. Share this video with them because... This is what God says. This is what God says through the entire word. He says these things. Excuse me. Sorry. This is what God says through the entire book. He has put every single person in place of power. Whether good or bad. You know? We have to do our part as believers. We have done a really, 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 really sorry job of sticking up for, for what's right. Some of us have, but collectively as a whole, we've done a horrible job. Prayer was taken out of schools. Abortion rate is at an all-time high. You know, same-sex marriage is allowed. Um, there's so many things that we've just allowed to happen. And now, and now times are getting even more not nonsensical times are getting um, to a point where reason no longer um, rules what are we going to do as believers what are we going to do as believers we you know for so long there was this teaching that you should just sit back like Yeshua because Jesus said nothing and he he never fought back you know um, Yeshua stood up for what was right him being passive to being crucified was simply because that was his destiny But Yeshua absolutely stood up for what was right. Sh stood up for the word of God. But there was, there was almost this spirit for so many years that Christians just shouldn't say anything. Shouldn't have an opinion. Um, shouldn't um, stick up for... Um, unrighteousness that was being allowed. And more so than that, you just have so many lukewarm believers these days, and that's in Christianity and in Judaism and in Messianic Judaism. I, although I would say probably less in Messianic Judaism just because 
they tend to be kind of on fire for God, but in, in all realms of those who worship the God of, of, of this Bible, um, we, we, we've become so laxed. We've been, we become so much like the world, nobody can tell the difference. And, um, and, and now we're seeing the results of that. Now we're seeing the results of, of us allowing uh, unrighteousness to, to enter into all facets of life. And it's, and it's very sad. It is very sad. Tamara says, yep, it's getting to a point where there's no morals. That's why I try to teach and raise my kids with morals, not to be racist or try to try to better themselves for from what I have lived. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And no, nobody should be racist. And that's, you know, that's on, that's on any level. You know, race, everybody's talking about today the whole race between racism between blacks and whites there there's been racism since the beginning of time against every culture against every person on this planet that is a hard issue that needs to be dealt with growing up 100% agree um and no we don't have any morals tamara sorry it's very sad dorian yes pray for the holy spirit to be poured out to wake up the unconscious Amen. Doreen, there's a, that's a great prayer. Wake up the unconscious. Why do we have so many people that are unconscious? Probably because we're so distracted. You know, not, not only do we have our own lives, but there's, there's so much deception. We have that, you know, the, that the media spews out. Um, and we're all in our own world. You, you know, the American way has become so, so much of all of us are so independent that we don't know how to be dependent on each other in certain ways. We don't know. Sometimes we, we have a hard time coming together as communities. And in some places you see this happening. But it, overall, as a, at, here in the United States, now I can't speak for other countries, but I, I, I would venture to say that a lot of other countries... We're, we're, we're independent, you know, I, we, we don't need anybody because we, we have so much here that we don't really, we don't really lack a whole lot. And so we need to relearn. And I hope we don't start to be forced to relearn because the economy crashes and then we need each other. But I hope we start to relearn how to uh, have the community mindset of, of, of working together. Um, yeah, I, I do, I do pray that the Holy Spirit wake us up. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes something really bad or catastrophic to, to shake us and wake us. And you know, those of us, we, we know the Bible. We know what it says. There's some major things that are coming. You know, there's some of us here in the United States that are thinking all of this craziness is going to settle down after the elections. This is just, all of this madness is just gearing up because of, of the elections that are coming. But I don't know, when I read my Bible, when I read Revelations, things are progressively going to spiral further and further and further down. We know this. We can only take uh, responsibility for ourselves as a body, and that's all we can do. We have become lovers of ourselves. That's what Norma, Norma said. We have become lovers of ourself. That's exactly right. That's exact, isn't, that what, isn't that what the Bible says? They will become self-loving um, you know, disregarding, uh, and disrespectful of parents, everything that the Bible says would happen in the last days is, is basically has happened. And it's, it's very sad, but, uh, but, but we do know who's in control. The almighty still sitting on his throne and he always keeps a remnant 
He always sets aside a remnant. So, you know, um, the world is going to continue to spiral out of control. We will continue to shine our lights. Hopefully as many as can be saved will be saved. But I really hope, and, and, and just for those of you that don't, that don't know, like this, this ministry, Keys to the Kingdom, I, I, I really didn't, um, I really didn't start it to, to, um, attract unbelievers. It was really for those who are already believers who want to go deeper, um, or who just want a fellowship with other believers who are on fire for God, or, or maybe even lukewarm believers that want to get rekindled and, 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 and light that fire to become more on fire for God. But it wasn't really to, to attract un you know new new unbelievers although we welcome un unbelievers i'm i'm you know more than welcome to have any anybody who's coming out of another religion or just coming out of the world to to come onto this page but you know the hopes was to have uh, a deeper um community it's predominantly females um i do kind of tend to believe that females should minister to females so it was targeted towards more of a female audience so that we could come together as female believers who want to deepen our relationship with God and stay on fire for God. God is in control. Doreen says God is in control. We are in control of our thought. We are in control of our thoughts and our hearts. That's right. God is in control of the events and we are in control of our thoughts and our heart. Amen. We do. We have to take personal responsibility. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this country um, will start to take responsibility for our, for our own actions and the repercussions of what's happening. Instead of pointing fingers at leadership and pointing fingers at people in power and saying, you're the reason. No, we have to look at ourselves. Do things need to change? There's a lot of things that need to change. There's a lot of things that need to change. And I just pray that, um, I really, really pray for you that, that you'll stay, that you'll stay in peace with God, that he will, that he will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding, that he will continue to anoint you in whatever path that he has you on, whether that, whatever that is, whether that's just at home and at work whatever path God has you on right now and whatever God has you, you know, in your little flock and your little family that God continues to anoint you in your family. Um, I hope this will bring more and I know it will bring more to know the relationship with Yeshua, Jesus. You know, Doreen, that's right. There's a lot of people right now, you know, because of the insanity of everything that's happening right now, People are going to start to, people are seeking right now. People are very much seeking spiritually. With everything going on, it causes you, so now we're forced to stop our normal lives, especially everything that happened with COVID. God forced us all on a global scale, on a worldwide scale. I don't care. You can blame China for sending the the disease. You can, you, you can blame whoever, whoever sent it. God will punish them. But God allows this virus to go around, whatever, however it happened. God will take care of those who did it. But he allowed it on a global scale. We all had to stop our own little lives and think and just look and just listen. We had nothing else to do but just stop and listen to what in the world is going, what are we doing? We're just, we're, we're, we're spinning a hundred miles an hour. So you're either going to get bitter or you're going to get better, right? You're going to get bitter from what's going on in the world or you're going to get better from what's going on in the world. And that's, um, that's our own personal choice. I hope we all get better. But these things do cause us to go inward and God knows that. And there are people who are unsaved who are definitely seeking answers 
uh, spiritual answers. They're looking. They're looking all around to find out, you know, you know, where do I go when I die? Where, you know, what happens after death? Is there a God in the universe? And I'm hoping that they end up finding the right answers uh, from the right people. You know, we have to pray for the lost, that they come to find uh, Yeshua as their Messiah so that they're able to enter into a relationship with the Almighty God, the Father. And make it good in his time. Amen, Noreen. It's all in God's time. It's all in God's timing. That's right. He has... He, he is orchestrating everything perfectly. He is. He is orchestrating. As chaotic as it seems to us, you know, those of us, I'm sure you are, when you're looking with spiritual eyes, God is perfectly orchestrating down to the minute second. And he has every single thing under control. It's not out of control. It's out of control to us. But God says, this is, this is going perfectly. This is going just as I planned. Because who spoke the end from the beginning? Who spoke the end from the beginning? In the beginning God spoke. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and He spoke the end from the beginning. So uh, we can rest in that. We can, um, we can have faith in that. We can have joy in that. And, 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 and I do believe that God has a purpose and a plan for every believer right now. Whatever that looks like, he has, he, he, he's, wherever God has you planted right now is for a reason. Whatever, whatever God has you doing right now or not doing right now is for a reason. And just rest in that because God's purposes are good. They're perfect. And, um, and, and he knows what he's doing. So, uh, I hope that you'll share this with this video with anybody who, who you see is kind of getting caught up in the minutia, getting caught up in the emotions. Um, those that are, are, are kind of riding the fence and they're, they're, they need to be refocused back on God. I hope you'll share this video with them. Uh, and uh, I pray that I pray that you'll just rest in the Almighty. I pray that you'll rest in our Savior Yeshua. And um, I pray that uh, He will continue to guide you into into the into the days ahead um, without any anxiety. I pray that you won't have any anxiety about what's going on around us, about what's going on in the world, uh, whether the virus or the chaos. I pray that you'll just rest in him because he has everything under control. He loves you so much. And uh, his, his sons and daughters are going to be glorified in all of this, no matter what's going on. His sons and daughters will be glorified in all of this. And I just pray all of this for you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. I pray that you will rest this Shabbat. And I pray that you will that you will be here next Shabbat and we will uh, see what else God wants to say. I, I have no idea. I'm just I might just resort back to the Torah portion and, and, and see what else God has to say. And uh, we'll study together. I love you. God bless you. And uh, We'll see you next Shabbat.